Ode on a Gratian Urn by John Keats. Presentation by Colby Lawson, Whitney Doyle, Manuel Gonzalez Vega. The poem. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvian historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than a rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in temp or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens aloft? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Her melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the sprite, deities of no tone, fair youth beneath the tree, thou canst not leave. That thy song nor ever can those trees be bare, bold lover, never, never can thou, thou kiss. Through winning near goal, goal yet, do not grieve. She cannot fade, thou, thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou, thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy bows, boss. That cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring aid you. And happy melodist, unwearied for every piping songs, for every new, more happy love. More happy, happy love. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever paint, panting, and forever young. All breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high, sorrowful, thy cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer low lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with the garland dressed? Will little town by river, seashore, or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? In the little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate and can ever return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude with braid of marble men and maidens overwrought. With forest branches and trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us of thought, as doth eternity cold pastoral. When old age shall this new generation wait, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours. A friend to man to whom thou sayst, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. About the author. John Keats was an English poet prominent in the second generation of romantic poets. Although his poems had been published for only four years before his, he died from tuberculosis at the age of 25, he was known for his vivid imagery and census appeal. Some of his other poems are To Autumn, Ode to a Nightingale, Endymion, Lamia, Eve of St. Agnes, When I Have Fears. Literary devices. Literary devices are used within poems to help make the poem more appealing for the audience to read. Symbol. Ode to a Grecian urn contains one major symbol, which is the urn. The urn itself represents the innocence of youth. Allegory. The urn is covered in allegories, as each of the stories on the urn represents something else than what is happening on the urn. Overstatement. The ode starts with an overstatement as Keats describes the urn as married to quietness. Irony of situation. 
The irony of the situation is that the narrator is completely enamored by the urn. Type of poem. Ode on a Grecian urn is an ode, as says in the title. An ode is an exalted, complex, rapturous lyric poem written about a dignified, lofty subject. Ode on a Grecian urn is an ode poem type. You can tell because of the way it dives into a lofty subject. In this case, it talks about how there is no escape in a world of pain and sorrow and how even in an imaginary world of peace and beauty, there is still pain. Another way to tell that an ode on a Grecian urn is by a, its rhyme scheme. An ode usually has a rhyme scheme to it, and an ode on a Grecian urn has just that. For example, thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. The rhyme scheme in this is A, B, A, B. The A, for example, would be quietness and express. B would be slow time and our rhyme. The meaning of this poem, honestly, at first, for me at least, it was hard to understand. Someone is in this museum talking to an urn, but this urn is meant to be telling the story, and at the same time, it's meant to be telling the story better than the narrator himself. So let's break down the story. The first stanza of our of the introduction is our, in is our introduction to this pot. This pot is still quote-unquote innocent. It has so much to give to the world, but in other words, it has so much to give to a man. Now, when I say it, yes, I'm talking about a pod, but in a different sense, I'm also talking about a woman. This woman is married to a man, but she has not, but she has not been exposed to the world itself. Therefore, it keeps up her innocent act. The rest of the first stanza is going on with question after question about what this pot is slash what it means. I honestly think that the question we all should be asking here in the first place is why is this man talking to a pot? A whole pot. But in these questions, the reader understands this woman is being chased against her will by a man who's portrayed as a god. Sure, the couple could be just can be just completely wholesome, but in most like in the most likely sense, it's not. Sorry, there's no happy ending here. Moving on to the next stanza, and and therefore for the rest of the poem, this man is already talking to a pot, which is an issue within itself. But now he's giving orders to a pot. No, you heard me. Orders to a pod. The beginning of this of the next stanza, the narrator is, is moved on to the next side of the pot. This pot this side of the pot is playing happy music, upbeat music, and all in all just happy times. The narrator is imagining and telling the pot to keep to keep playing the song that he's that he's been hearing in his head. Moving on, moving on from that, the man is living in a fantasy world. Is living in a fantasy world. We move back now we move back to the first side of the pot with the man chasing the woman. The narrator explains to the man on the pot that he will never be able to get the girl, no matter how hard he tries, no matter how fast he runs, he will never be able to have her. But on the other end of the spectrum, while he can't have the girl, the girl will never disappear. They are frozen in time. Their love, has, their love will never fade for each other. The woman, she will never be able to get away from him. While it sounds completely bad in it, while the scene is completely bad to a whole new level, it lines up with the poem. We all, with the meaning of this poem. We all tend to want to live in the happy moments of life. I mean, who, want, who wouldn't want to? It's a time where we all, it's a time where we can't get hurt. I'm so sorry to this man in the poem that I was, dis, that I was just dissing you this whole entire part of, my, part of my presentation for saying that you're crazy. But in all, in all honesty, we all just want to live in the happy moments. And that's the whole meaning of this poem. All right, how did you guys feel about the poem, Colby? Um, so I feel like the poem is mainly being John Keats using his way own way of 
ridiculing, ridiculing and criticizing the Romanticist movement at this time, as the poem, I think, would be considered quite controversial during the period of which he wrote this, which was a Romanticist upheaval, or, well, a Romantic period of literature, as of which you would see people looking, re-examining history and during the Renaissance and such. But not only was this a new time of thinking and intellectual upbringing for people, it was also a time as of which there was a heavy increase in religion and the fanaticism of it throughout Europe. And I think that the within this poem contains, you know, sex, hedonism, and all sorts of things that the church would consider would consider sins within this poem. So, and in the same way, the guy who is talking to an urn is a romantic. And I think that he has a sort of comical situation as which he's able to criticize, you know, what you could view as like an average romantic person who is in love with and writing romantic literature. But yeah, I also think that this is just meant to be a controversial poem. It was meant to, st to step on people's toes throughout the period. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with you. All that you said was pretty true. Um, I agree on the part that it is meant to kind of, like you said, step on their toe, make you feel that it is um, just all in all what you said. Whitney, how do you feel? Honestly, at first I hated this poem. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I actually hated it. But more I read it, I actually, I'm thinking we do this way too much in our daily lives of wanting to live and just the happy moments. Because life is not like that, unfortunately. We have to go through the trials and tribulations of life, being sad, happy, mad, all the other, all those other emotions. But honestly, writing, the, I think this poem was just difficult to understand at first until I'm like, oh, he just wants, like the man the, in the urn just wants to be happy. And I connect that back to the narrator. Like, I think the narrator is in the museum to get away from life because it's slow. There's like, it's a slow part of time. No one's there. He can get away. And I think that was just like him trying to stay in like a happy moment of his life and not go out into the world and deal with it, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, that definitely connects to, you know, the area of, era of literature as of which John Keats wrote this, which was romantic, which was about trying to get away from what was happening in life and, you know, kind of putting your head in the clouds and looking for literature as a way to escape what is currently going on. And I think that could also be used as a way to sort of criticize romanticism still, as that there are too much head in the clouds and such and aren't actually looking at what's going on within life. Um, what did you guys think that the urn represented within the story? Then just overall, its impact on the story. Yeah, so... Um, I felt that the urn was this representation of an imaginary world of peace and beauty and all that good stuff. But as uh, Whitney was talking about earlier in her uh, representation of how she felt, she mentions the, a woman chasing a man and that time is stopped. I believe that that woman represents all the pain and hardships going on in the world and that the man running is um this imaginary world and that soon eventually um the woman is supposed to catch up to her or him for me at first i thought this pot had nothing to do with living life in the moment and living life and happiness i honestly thought about sexual intercourse and right <laughs> That sounds so bad, but I did. Because at first I'm like, the woman is shaped, like the man is chasing the woman, and this man is depicted as a godlike figure. And that my mind instantly just like connected it towards sexual intercourse, like what most happens in like romantic literature and Greek mythology and gods. But that's like what I thought at first it meant. And I had to read this poem like five more times to understand that I was completely wrong. I mean, yeah. yeah, we were oh, talking about where the bold lover is depicted as like a godlike being. He looked very similar to Zeus and such within Greek mythology, where he would go and try to woo different women of different shapes and sizes and whatever. Um, I definitely didn't get that right part, though. Uh, 
Because, okay, they're chasing up. Like, okay, one girl, the woman's running away, but the man's chasing her. It, it reminds me of, like, other, like, poems that we read. Um, what's the one we just read in class? Oh, my God. Ah. Uh, it was one of, it was some, it was one of them. We can have to a whole discussion about it. I totally forgot about the name. It'll come to me, like, at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. But, I don't know, like, just when I see a woman running away from a man during, like, when, like, people wrote during this time, it just makes me connect to all of that stuff, I'm like, because it was not, it wasn't, it really wasn't against her, like, it was against her will that she wanted to be with him, because obviously she has no love for him, but he has all the love for her. Yeah, and John Skeets does describe him as a bold lover and such. Um, personally, I thought the runner represented innocence of youth and such as it pretty much everything in the urn is just on that verge of becoming something else but still is what you could describe as like a mythical place where i thought pretty much everyone was happy you know there is music that has yet been unplayed and yada yada and it seems like there's a large festival going on and they're all celebrating the happiness of life and such and that they're all running around with joy uh, so I always thought that that represented the innocence of youth and how life was still just this happy place to be living until, boom, adulthood would hit and things would start to get a bit more serious. Yeah, the happiness to me, it seems like the cover-up is like, say if you go down, like, go downtown, see a festival happening, you don't think about all the bad things that are happening around you. It's like the happy music, the partying, it's the cover-up of what's really going on beneath this urn or quote unquote the world at the moment yeah and that could definitely be definitely again connected back to the how this is a romantic era literature and how it's meant to be covering up and presenting a happy form of what's going on and something that you could escape to instead of the actual world so that's why it represented the innocence of youth to me though is that it's no see we both saw this a completely different way which is totally fine i, I just thought like the party is like to cover up from like this woman wanting to be totally just away from this man in life yeah i i like both your both the ways you saw it um whitney a little concerned about how you saw it but other than that <laughs> you um, can't tell me you okay when you first read it it's not like you say uh yes there happened this couple is just completely wholesome I mean, yeah like children playing tag or something is what i thought They're like it's These a little people... fairy tale this is no fairy tale. This is about hard hitting life lessons. All righty, all righty. Um, why, why do you guys think Keats wrote this? Um, like, how does this pertain to his personal life? Oh, I got this one. Um, since we talked about him having like tuberculosis, I don't know what year he died. I don't know if he wrote it, like if he died after this or any. Well, he obviously died after this, but. I don't know how soon it was, but anyone who's like knowing they're on their deathbed would, would want to just stay in the happy moments because it's death. Need I say more? Yeah, it's definitely a good way to view it. Um, I thought John Keats wrote this because, again, I thought that he was viewed more as a controversial author within the time period, and that, again, he was mainly providing it as a critic criticism of romanticist literature. And just the whole era during this time period. Manny, what do you think he wrote this for? So I think he wrote this because um, taking it back to how I thought it was about um, escaping from this world of pain into this imaginary world of uh, pain, or not pain, of, of beauty and peace. Um, I believe he wrote it to try and get away from his real life with his mother and brother dying, his mother dying of what he died, tuberculosis, um, at a young age. He was only 25 when he passed. Um, I believe that his father wasn't really there in the picture. And this, all this poem writing was in a way to escape. And this poem in particular was really him trying to um, imagine that world of beauty with no pain. But obviously, when he's talking about the party and all that, then he starts going into the girl chasing the man. And then we start to think uh, there can't be a world of beauty and peace because no matter what, 
no matter if it's imaginary or anything like that, there's always going to be pain, pain in it. As he was writing this, I'm sure he was writing it, imagining this world of beauty. But as he's writing, he realizes there is no beauty without pain, basically. So what do you guys kind of think is the deeper meaning behind the poem that John Keats is trying to say to us? Mm, live in the moment. Yeah, like live in the moment, but also find the silver line. Like you can't just live in the moment. If you do, you're missing out on valuable emotions that you need to be a functional human being and not just be that quote unquote innocent girl, well, innocent woman in the urn. You have to go out and like be quote, well, he, what he says, ravished by life to actually learn something yeah yeah i i like that um personally i think that it was there's no beauty without pain um basically going back to what i was saying about him imagining this world but in imagining it he realizes that even in imaginary worlds, it will be pain. Um, like, this is kind of a broad example, but um, not trying to assume anything, but I've heard a lot of women say, you know, beauty is pain, that they go through a lot just to look a certain way for um, whoever they're attracted to. definitely different look i definitely saw this differently than living within the present and looking for the present how do you feel about the phone oh sorry go ahead <laughs> it's all right manny um i think that john keats meant this to look more towards the future whereas you know the guy is still chasing the girl the music still is yet unplayed and the trees are still yet to go through the harsh winter and lose their leaves i think it was more about looking towards the future and knowing that the best is still yet to come and such and that this is you know, the best music is the music yet unheard is that sort of represents my period. And my train of thought is that they still haven't heard the music, but yet the anticipation for hearing that in the future is more of what he was trying to communicate is that you should look forward for, look forward towards in the future. Yeah. Okay, let's back around real quick. Sorry, Manny, but y'all can't be concerned about me when I thought this was about something sexual because he says ravished. Who says ravish in a poem when it doesn't mean anything sexual? Uh, Anyways, um, <laughs> thank you for attending our discussion. Uh, hope Still unwrap. Yeah. That what was that? That was about the urn, though. This whole thing's about. Th Wait, what? He says unravish about the urn. Either Not the one girl being on the urn. in this poem. All right. Thank you for attending this discussion. Questions. Number one, what does the urn represent to you? Two, what does the narrator's obsession with the urn say about romanticism at that time? Three, why would someone slow down time to stay in a world of happiness?